made you sing. How many was here? You remember that? Okay, I'm not gonna do it this year. Promise. But I just thought I would uh, I would reminisce a little bit about that. So uh, yeah, it's a great day to be uh, here for a meeting. Great day to be inside. Got a lot to talk about. Uh, we got some. Uh, Got kind of maybe a little bit of a tough topic here, how to use legumes, cover crops. I mean, here we are, we're in western New York State. I mean, it's not like you live in Georgia where you can grow things year round. But before I get started, in case any of you are wondering, the slide is a little crooked, but nobody had a 15 foot ladder to straighten that projector out, so you just got to deal with it. So I, I hope that my message today is straight, though. Okay? So let's talk about uh, focusing on uh, legume cover crops. And just show of hands here, how many are using cover crops? Figured a lot of you are, that's awesome. Uh, cover crops, very simple concept, very complex to pull it off, to make them pay and all those things. I'm not gonna be going over many fundamentals here per se. I wanna give you some options, some things you might think about. And I will just say right up front, for some of you, it may be difficult to include legumes in your operation. I get that. I'm not here to twist arms. I'm not here to say you have to do this. I'm here to hopefully make you think a little bit about what you can do, what options you have out there that can help make you essentially a better farmer. So let's dive in. Challenges. Let's just be right up front. What are some of the challenges in using legumes? Well, as you know here, a very limited planting window. Just not a lot of time here. Your growing season is relatively short in the context of things. Although, I've been to northern Alberta. Their growing season is a lot shorter than yours, and they're using cover crops. So nobody has any excuse. I once heard a guy from Florida said, don't have time to plant cover crops. I'm like, he says, I triple crop. So he plants three, he tries to plant three cash crops in a row. And then in our conversation, this is an area farmer around Lake Okeechobee. And I said, is there any four week window of opportunity where you don't really have anything growing in that triple cropping system? Yeah, he said, after silage, we kind of wait for whatever reason. I said, why don't you grow sun and sort of sedan grass then? He's like, idea. So sometimes, you know, we all think we have our challenges. We all think somebody else has it better, right? But we do have to work with what we have here. Uh, legumes, they don't tend to be as winter hardy. Your options are less. And that's just a fact. Now we're working on that. Some of the legumes now are more winter hardy. And there's some breeding going on to help with that. That's good. Some are higher cost per acre. Again, it's a reality, it's a challenge out there. And there's a couple reasons for that. Another reason, uh, I'm gonna sing, single out hairy vetch. How many of you planted hairy vetch as a cover crop? Okay, what is a problem with hairy vetch? Hint, it's up on the screen. Hard seed. Hard seed, what is hard seed? When we say hard seed, what I mean, anybody know? You're down to talk. What is hard seed? Late Don, okay, Don. Late, late to germinate. Late to germinate, or it could be one to three years later after you plant it. Typically, when you buy hairy vetch seed, on the tag, it may say hard seed. And it may be three to five percent. Could be a little lower, a little higher. Meaning when you put that seed in the ground in 2019, we'll say, it may not grow till 2020. It's hard, it doesn't germinate, it has to go through a little bit more of a process. So I like to say to people, if you plant hairy batch in your farm, you might want to just put it to the deed to your farm. Because it does hang around. And for some people they're scared of that because it's like an unwanted weed, if you will. I see it as an advantage, just essentially a free cover crop. I think I'm going to talk about this a little bit more later on, but again, this is about managing these crops. But I will say it can be a challenge here. Why do we want to use legumes? Well, I think one of the things we talk about, and part of the, the title of my topic here is, can replace 
purchased nitrogen. So obviously that's a cost for us. If we can grow our own, take the nitrogen out of the air, what percent of nitrogen is in this air in this room? Anybody? What is it? Come on, there gotta be some. 70. That's close enough for today. 70% of the air we breathe has nitrogen in it. It's all around us. These lagoons have the ability to take it out of the air, put it in the ground. And they do it for their own growth, but they'll actually actually supply it for other plants as well. And so how can we leverage that? How can we use that? I'm saying here that if the price of nitrogen goes 25% or more higher, the interest in the legumes will increase. Nobody knows what the price of nitrogen will be. Right now, it's, I think we can say it's fair. Right? It's fair in the context of agriculture. There's things that can happen in this world. This world's a volatile place, by the way, that are way beyond our control, where someday the price of nitrogen will go higher. It could be a short-term spike, it could be a long-term trend. Who knows? Is nitrogen going to be regulated? Is it going to be taxed? All these things are kind of out there. This is a good reason why we need to have this topic today. And I'm not going to try to tell you that just by growing a legume, you can eliminate purchased nitrogen. And it's very difficult to make the case that legumes and the current nitrogen pricing will actually pay for themselves. They can, but again, I'm not going to push this too hard. Right now, it's close. It's a little difficult to do the math and make nitrogen produced by cover crops, by the green cover crops, pay in the light of nitrogen production alert. Now, we know the cover crops do a lot of other things, so in that case, we can make the statement, oh yeah, legumes can pay. You know, putting organic matter in the soil, helping your other cover crops grow, and a bunch of different things like that. Why use legumes? Diversity of species. We all want to mimic nature as much as possible, right? So how can we be diverse in that? Adding legumes is a, is a way we can do that. <coughs> Excuse my a little dry cough here. It just uh, finishing off a cold, so bear with me a little bit in that. So in the diversity realm, we can also the legumes can help grass cover crops grow better when mixed. How many of you ever seen that? Where you planted a legume with a grass type cover crop and you can see that the grass cover crop grew better. Have you ever seen that? Anybody? Okay, Don's seen it. And that just kind of proves that legumes can add nitrogen. And I have at the bottom here, just overall better soil health. It's kind of under that diversity thing. And, and that's why you might want to consider legumes for some of these reasons that I've listed here. Well, I want to show you a picture of how this could look. Now, I've got to explain a little bit what's behind this picture. Uh, I had grown um, oil seed rape, uh, or canola. Some of you know it as canola. This is actually oil seed rape that I grew for uh, Purdue. That would be the chicken people. You've heard of Purdue chickens. They were contracting high uric acid oil seed rate for special use that they had. And I planted this oil seed rate and I noticed my, what I call legacy vetch, starting to grow up with the oil seed rate or the hard seed from years of hairy vetch on my farm. I called the representative up. I said, how tight's your contract? because I knew that the hairy vest was going to be ready about the same time the oil seed rate was to harvest. And there's no way I knew to get the hairy vest out of the oil seed rate, you know, from a herbicide standpoint. He said, why do you ask? They texted him a picture of the hairy vetch blooming in the oil seed rate. He goes, I'll be over tomorrow. <laughs> it's like, okay. I wasn't too worried, but he said, I said, the option is to desiccate early, which we have to desiccate the plant to, to harvest the oil seed rate, or let it go a little longer, let the hairy vetch mature, the new is going to mature a little later than the 
velocity rate, and then separate the seeds. Hairy batch seeds are like the size of a common BB. Oil seed rate is much smaller than that, very small. And I thought we could separate them. We decided to separate them. And long story short, made more money off the vetch than I did the oil seed grade. Because that's what we did. We harvested them together. And I'm going to end my presentation here today showing you a picture of a different situation where we're growing more crops together. Because I learned it from this. Okay, so after I took that field off, again, the hairy vetch was not even because it wasn't planted. It was legacy vetch. It was, it was uh, hard seed vetch. So here's my field. After I took off the oil seed grape hairy vetch, I went in and planted a mix of summer cover crops, because it's July when I did that. This picture was taken roughly end of August, I'll say. Oh, you can see the corn up there. Middle of August, maybe, end of August, something like that. And if you look closely, you see the different shades of the sorghum sedan grass. And even if you look uh, over here, there's kind of a band going out there. That was actually from previous year. I'd done some hairy vetch uh, special variety that I planted there. But when you see this dark spot, that's where the hairy vetch was. So I say all that to show you there is a legume effect of nitrogen production. So this is the sorghum sedan grass you see in here. You can see there's a difference. So that's what I want to prove to you that it actually does work. So some of the key things you should know about working with legumes. If you want to manage peak nitrogen, if you're going for peak nitrogen, at first bloom, and this applies to Austrian winter peas, crimson clover, hairy vetch, that's when your peak nitrogen is produced that you can assume to be used for your next crop. Now that nitrogen is both in the ground as nodules, as the storage components of a legume, or above the ground in the plant matter, the biomass on top. When that starts to degrade, it can start to release some nitrogen back into the soil. But most of the nitrogen is going to come from the nodules that have been produced in the soil. So that generally occurs at first bloom. Sometimes we can't wait till first bloom. The calendar's thickened. We've got to plant corn. You don't have much time up here to grow it. So I'm not saying you have to wait this long. I'm just telling you that's when maximum nitrogen occurs at that point. Um, and then you kind of need to know then how much of that nitrogen will be available to your cash crop. And that's all over the place. I mean, you, I know you'd like me to give you a number, um, but there's a lot of variables. If you have a mix there, let's say you have some uh, cereal rye mixed in or triticale. You're going to have to deduct a little bit because that cereal rye triticale or that grass in the mix took up some of that nitrogen to its own growth and it doesn't, generally doesn't release it until later on in the summer, maybe not until next year, depending on how mature it is. So understanding some of these things are important when you're managing the legume cover crops. What are the best nitrogen producing species? Well, the most popular winter annual legumes, mentioned several times here, hairy vetch. Probably without um, any unanimous agreement, hairy vetch has the potential to put the most nitrogen out there. Then we got crimson clover, balanza clover, didn't mention that. Uh, that's kind of a new one. It's uh, uh, the, the one brand is Fixation. How many of you ever heard of Fixation? They've done pretty heavy advertising. Uh, but, um, has anybody tried it? What do you think, Don? He likes it. What about you? Uh, we didn't seem to, uh, it didn't grow very well for us. It didn't grow very well for them, for him. Um, I've tried it. I've seen it. Um, I think it's to be in the mix. It merits a mention. To be determined. Needs to be tested a little bit more. Steve, answer, we use it in the mix. Pardon me? We use it in the mix. So it's used in the mix. And that's just a case for why you do mixes, especially for some of this newer stuff that's untested. If it fails or if it doesn't do as good as you want, the mix may cover up for some of that uh, shortcoming. So great, great plan. Um, cool season legumes. I have fava bean and lupins. They will winter kill here, but they'll grow until it gets about in the mid-teens. 
If you've grown any radishes, they'll, they'll, they'll die about the same time radishes would die. Uh, summer annuals, most popular are sun hemp and cowpeas. This would be for those of you, is there any vegetable processors here uh, that grow for vegetables? Okay, so you may have opportunity in the summer, I don't know what you all grow, but to, to plant a summer annual. Again, this is, this is only going to be in July and maybe the middle of August or so. So for those of you who have that option, these are the most popular ones. Okay, which ones did I miss? There's more out there, but are there other ones that I missed that you're familiar with or have tried? Anything? Any lagoons? on any winter, cool, summer. So this is, no, nothing to add to this. Medium red clover. Medium red clover. That's been historically used a lot. I mean, if you go back to decades ago, our grandparents, that's what they would have used. Typically that was put into wheat, like under seeded or frost seeded in the spring, kick the wheat off, grows up, take a cutting, Next year, plow down, plant corn. That was a very common rotation, a very good species for that. Making a little comeback now, and maybe should have worn a mention up there, but our medium red clover is definitely a one of Is there any more you can think of? Yes? Bursine clover. clover. Anybody ever try that? Have you tried it? Yeah. And thoughts? Okay, so if you get it in at the right time, it shows some promise, I think is what I hear you say. And in the mix. And in the mix, right. Any more? Anything I might have been missing here? Okay, so that just gives you an idea of these are the most popular ones. And again, there's a list of probably a dozen more we could come up with if we had to. But these are popular for a reason. It's because they seem to be working. Um, so, and this is more Maybe on a national scale, not so much Western New York, but you know it pretty much applies here as well. So here's the big challenge here in getting them planted. <clears throat> so I'm just going to say plant as soon as possible. I don't know what that means to you. Uh, for some, you may say, "Well, that's impossible. I have no planting window." Well, maybe you need to rearrange some of your cropping strategies. I don't know your individual systems, but I like to say the cover crops are not like finding missing puzzle piece. Usually it usually has to do with rearranging the picture, so to speak. So in order to fit them in, you might have to do something different. So interceding at V4 corn. I talked about that the last time I was here. How many of you have interceded into uh, knee-high corn? OK, a few of you. And I know that's not a slam dunk, but it's an option. And uh, don't have much time to talk about it here this morning, but that would be one of the ways that you could get a legume, since that's what we're talking about here, into your system. And uh, again, there's people here who have done it, and you can ask, you know, what are the tricks of that and what makes that work. Using a short season cash crop, I hesitated putting that in here for you guys because I know you're kind of already in the short season space, but maybe there's some options there. I'm, I'm not going to. Uh, harp on this very much, but using a short season corn or beans may help get something planted earlier. Maybe for some of you in a little bit of a microclimate somewhere, it tends to stay a little bit warmer, that might be an option for you. After small grain, and we have any grain farmers, wheat, barley, oats, anybody? Raise your hands higher so I can see. Good, okay. For you, you have probably the easiest window. And if you get them off early enough, you get your weed off by, let's say, the middle of July. Planting a sun hemp or a cow pea is a valid option. Um, or you just may want to go with hairy beds, winter peas, or something like that. That is clearly probably the easiest planting window that you will have to grow legumes. Now, does that mean that you should put small grains into your operation? I understand the challenges of markets and so forth, but I would challenge you to consider it. You have a market for straw around here. Um, that could be another uh, factor um, and, and all that. So uh, small grains, something you might want to consider. Or uh, maybe I could just, I'm going to say this at the end, I know, but for some of you, growing some cover crop seeds, growing some rye for seed, uh, growing some triticale for some seed, 
uh, buckwheat for seed, uh, different things like that, and then begin to open up some planting windows on a few acres or a few fields so that you can get some more legumes planted. Because I want to tell you something. You want to be a little prepared in case the price of nitrogen does go up. So experimenting a field or two is not a bad idea. Uh, so you can kind of figure out how this works if indeed that could occur. And I say here too, follow the combine. If you do have a window in the fall, whatever you can do to try to get it in. Now I just walked in here this morning and a gentleman came up and said, have you ever heard of anyone putting a cover crop seeder on a four inch harvester? Like a corn chopper. And I said, well yeah I did. My neighbor Amish do that. Yeah, you know about the Amish, they have one row, binder they call it. So they go around the field one row at a time. Every four rows, they click on their little cedar, electric little cedar run by a battery, and it spins out cover crops for the four rows at a time, about 10 feet. So if the Amish can do it, you guys can do it, right? So we talked about you know, different ways of, of doing that. Uh, there have been some people put cover crop seeders on combines where they actually take the seed and put it underneath the snouts. So when the corn comes down, the cover crop's underneath there and it's underneath the fodder. Not a bad idea. Soybeans, put it on the behind the head on the front with the deflectors, blow it out there and the residue comes out the back, covers it up. Corn chopper, you can fit it on there. Probably custom operators don't want to stop for five minutes and reload every hour. And now custom operators like to run and it's full speed ahead. Don't stop for anything. So I get that, but just saying that these are some options that are out there to get planted sooner. So we're going to have to change something to accomplish what our goals are here a lot of times. And um, like I've said, cover crops are a simple concept, but very complex to pull them off and maximize that. And this is where you guys gotta get your brains together. That's why we're here together today, to connect, to network, to, to talk about how can we maybe implement some of this stuff. So another thing about legumes is we need to use an inoculant. Why is that? Where's our students here today? Students of agriculture. I don't mean someone that's still in college. We're all learning, right? Why do we use inoculant for legumes? Anybody help me out here? Anybody? Reintroduce the bacteria. So introduce, reintroduce the bacteria, the rhizobium, that is, I'm going to say, the critters that help the legume take the nitrogen out of the air and store it. So that's a process with the life in the soil, the biological process. So um, there are different types of inoculant. Hairy vetch and peas are kind of together. Clovers are separate. They're all different than soybeans, by the way. You're used to using inoculant soybeans, but there's no soybean inoculant that really actually works in cover crops. Uh, fava beans. Lupins, I know probably any of you probably use that, but lupins have their own inoculant. They have it, it's so, so specific, you have to get lupin inoculant. Now, there's companies now that sell cover crop inoculant, and they kind of cover the bases with multiple strains. So, over here we have King's Agri-Seeds. Do you have inoculant that does covers the bases, so to speak, with multiple legumes? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, is it pretty comprehensive? There's any legume? It, it covers most anything you would use. The popular ones. Yeah. So there you go. That's what the cover crop industry now has kind of made it easier for you. You don't have to buy specific inoculants. And inoculants are not that expensive. So you may have that rhizobia in your soil. And it's kind of like soybeans. Is it worth it to put inoculant on or isn't it? And generally, like, yeah, probably is, you don't know. In the rhizobia that has been in your soil can survive, but it also can die. Prolonged wet periods kill it off. So especially if you've had that, you know, make sure you put it on. Uh, I'm here to tell you that uh, when I first got into planting legumes, I remember one evening, there was rain coming until the next morning. So I got the planter filled up, the 
kind of got around doing everything, and I was like left to go plan like 9 p.m. And I thought, oh, I forgot to put a knocking on him. It's 9 p.m., I'm gone. I planted three fields. Two of those fields, and it was a mix, by the way, that had Harry Vetch in. Two of those fields had never had Harry Vetch in before. One of them did. And the difference was night and day. Where it had Harry Vetch the previous year, it grew like you would expect. Where it didn't, it was lethargic, it was pale. And it was a mix of Harry Vetch and rye. The rye didn't grow as much. It was like one third less according to my, what it looked like. So that, the inoculant is important. And the other thing too, you need to keep your inoculant fresh and alive, cool and dry. You can't throw it on top of a pallet that's maybe inside your shed and the sun comes up and is shining on it. You'll kill it. So I've been told by inoculant companies, even though you don't think you're putting a lot on, if you ever look at the label, and see how many like billions or trillions per gram of critters are in there. It's like, how can that be possible? How do they know that? Well, now the companies have told me they actually, their suggested rates are usually 10 times what you really need, but because people are so careless the way they have their inoculant, that they have to make them rates higher. So they, if you keep, when you get your inoculants, if you put them in your refrigerator, or a refrigerator, um, you know, the, kitchen boss may not like you to put inoculants in the kitchen refrigerator, so be careful there. But put your inoculants in a cool, dry place in the last long time. Now the other thing too about inoculants, I'm spending some time on this, because you want to maximize these lagoons. Inoculants have shelf life, and there's an expiration date listed on every package. Some inoculants are stronger than others. For instance, pea inoculant is weak. Now you correct me if I'm wrong over here with Kings, but pea inoculant is weak. To, to pre-inoculate peas is not advisable. Clover and alfalfa, yes, that's a stronger inoculant. Maybe hairy vetch. But I'm telling you, the best thing you do is to apply it right before seeding. That's the best. Uh, now some, some of these uh, companies will put seed coating with inoculant in it, and that's great. That's nice and convenient. But not all of that, that can be done. And even that can be subject to killing it if it's exposed to heat, particularly. Heat's what kills it. And sometimes just having a pallet outside or you know, if you keep it in a shed where the sun doesn't hit it, you're probably good. So these are little things to know about inoculant and how to properly apply it just before planting. I like to say it's cheap insurance, but uh, do you have anything more to add for me? Is there anything I missed in the inoculant part? Um, just that. So most cases, it's specific to the species. Correct. Back here was a hand. Yes. So uh, you say heat kills an inoculant. Is there a threshold to the downside where you're going to kill an inoculant? For the low temperature? Yeah, which reason for, for the OK, do you know the answer to that question? How cold can it survive? I, I don't know that. I, I don't know that either. Cold is OK. Yeah. So the use case being the frosty and clover, you inoculate. Yeah, that's fine. Now, out in a, in a shed that's not tight and it's 15 below zero, I, I think I would put it in somewhere. I don't think I would take that chance. I don't know, though. Right. Does anybody know? How cold can an inoculant survive? Yeah. I know for sure it doesn't like heat. That we do know. OK? Awesome. So I'll say cheap insurance, usually less than a dollar an acre. I spent a lot of time on this here. But if you're using lagoons, know how to use them. Know how to maximize them. Because they are, they do tend to be a little expensive. They do tend to be that. And uh, so this is this is kind of you know why I wanted to highlight that a little bit. So use winter hardy selections. Harry Vetch is probably considered the most winter hardy. There are some Harry Vetch varieties, selections out there now that are being bred for more winter hardiness. I've been involved with the USDA uh, research on that. USDA is now breeding cold or tolerant winter hardy hairy vetch. How many of you do that? Well, they are. And I was a part of it in my farm. I also developed a variety myself that is now being sold out in the market that is a little more winter hardy than what has been in the market. So we're getting some 
Getting some promising strains coming here that are going to benefit a little bit better. Um, uh, Balanza clover there, we talked about this before. I think that still needs to be tested a little bit. Um, you know, the, some of the claims I see behind this variety I think are a little aggressive. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, I think this is a good, a good uh, legume cover crop. Austrian winter pea probably is going to survive here if you have snow when you have the coldest temperatures. Um, and just so you know, this applies to all cover crops. Cover crops are like people. It's about the temperature and the wind chill. So if you have a cold 10 below morning and the ground is bare, you're going to struggle for any of these cover crops to survive. But if there's just two to three inches of snow, it doesn't matter how cold it is and how hard that wind's blowing. It's pretty much going to survive. And I know that doesn't happen all the time, but this part of the country you tend to have snow. So you may be able to get away with some things because you have snow. And um, it's kind of an interesting dynamic. It's not so much about how cold it is. It's more about the wind chill is what I've seen across the nation. Wind chill is what will kill the cover crops. Cold will too. But to factor in the wind chill, and then of course if there's snow on the ground, for instance, I've seen, I, I've seen a study um, by a company who said their cover crop supply survived in New York and it was 15 below zero. I'm like, that is totally meaningless. Because if there was snow, of course it would survive. That's not even impressive. Now, if it was 15 below with no snow cover, and 30 mile an hour winds, and wind chill is 45 below, now we're talking. You know, so again, when you hear some of this stuff, it really comes down to what works in your area. And being able to plant new things in a mix, in the context of a mix, sometimes will help it survive. That's a case for mixes, because you give a little protection around it. And then, do you have snow or do you not? Sometimes you'll take the chance. I'm gonna plant this, we have snow, it's gonna survive. If not, now well, probably won't. Understanding this, is important. This is where I'll say, uh, you know, you got to treat it like your cash crops. Sometimes our cash crops don't perform well, and we understand that because of weather and what have you. Fava bean, this would only be for late summer after small green, small greens. Uh, and they'll go to about 15 degrees, a night or two at 15 degrees, we'll take fava beans out. But they'll take the first killing frost, they'll keep growing, they are a cool season, they'll keep growing when it's 50 degrees in the day. Um, so, uh, and that, that's good. Fava beans have actually been shown to produce more nitrogen than hairy vetch in a warmer season climate. Where they're given a chance to grow late summer, they can really put on some serious uh, production. So, another strategy here that maybe you can fit in your legume cover crops is to plant your cash crops as late as possible. Now, you probably never heard anybody from the front say that. It's always as early as possible. But what I mean by this, this is, this is what's key for this statement, the last fields you plant. You can't get all your crops planted the first day it's ready, right? So if you have a hairy batch or a crimson clover field, plant, that's the last one. Because some years you don't get, you, whatever, you just can't get things planted. So this is strategies here. And some years it's going so good, I'm not going to wait for that first bloom. The soil's fit, the temperature's right, I'm going to plant, and that's what I'd recommend. But other years, we've got some wet springs. Why not let these things pull out the water so you can plant? Why don't you let them grow? Planting green. I'm going to mention that a little bit at the end here. Um, and right there it is, actually. Um, delay germination as late as possible. So you can plant corn if it's, if it's on the wetter side. And either right before it comes up, or if it's herbicide traded corn, leave it come up for two or three leaves. And then, you know, so you get a couple more pounds of nitrogen. These are strategies that I think you can do to make your legumes work a little bit better for you uh, in this climate around here. Mixed with other species, I've alluded to that. One plus one equals three. That is synergistic cover crop math. And I've seen it so many times. When you compare single species to mixed species, especially when they're mixed up right, 
where they can actually grow better and actually you can start reducing your seeding rates. Just because you put mixed seeds together doesn't mean that the price goes out the window. <clears throat> you, can, you, you can lower the individual species within a mix to keep your seeding costs the same. Um, a low rate of a grass type, zero rye, tree kale, and barley, whatever, <clears throat> that will give an allowed trellising and full expression of the lagoon. See right here, um, that's, um, I believe that's triticale there. You have a little hairy bat, a little crimson clover, he can grow up. Especially hairy bat to me. If it's just by itself, it's binding. It grows flat. And it actually almost suffocates itself. You ever been in a straight hairy bat field, you pull it up and it's six feet long, and the bottom two thirds is nothing but step. It's all rotted out sometimes. But when you plant it with a, a more erect plant, like Sue right, it grows better. It's, it's trellis, it's erect, it stays more healthy. And then just because you have that um, cereal rye taking some of the nitrogen it produces, it actually grows more because it wants to meet that need. That's what I mean by synergistic. One plus one equals three. Synergistic cover crop math. And understanding that can help you save a little money in your seeding rates and so forth and maximizing your legumes in this case. Hard seed. Did, I did talk about that. Um, here's what I want to point out to you. If, you. if you're growing wheat in your rotation, it will grow with wheat. You will be spraying your wheat. And we got some herbicides now. The, the, the old standby was just add a little 2,4-D with Harmony Extra. That would clean it up. Now there's a new one for wheat, tree kale, and I'm not sure what all grains, called QX. Q U L E X, I think, or Q U I L E X. Q L X will take out hairy vetch. Done it two years now. If you're growing wheat and you had any hairy vetch in that field within the past three years, assume there'll be a few hairy vetches growing in that wheat. Now, unless you're organic, it's easy to take out with herbicides. But the, the, the hairy vetch and wheat grow very well together as a cover crop. As a cash crop, you're going to have to manage that hairy vetch. And I say, not a problem. You just have to know how to manage it. Well, I also say that having hard seed is essentially a free cover crop because um, it comes up every year. You just need to manage it. I don't mind when I'm harvesting corn seeing a little hairy bet scattered around. Uh, in the soybeans, it doesn't seem to hurt much. Sometimes they'll, they'll grow up in the summer and they'll, they'll get around a few plants, but generally that hasn't been a problem for harvest. Um, so just a, it's kind of like the FYI uh, for for hairy vetch and what you're doing with that, how to manage it. I want to take you through a little research I did, just kind of bolster the idea of what legumes can do. And this is for corn. This is after small grain now. So we're talking an ideal planting window, and you can just look at those uh, cover crops over there. They're pretty much um, well, they're all legumes. I have some new ones there. We can talk about yellow blossom, sweet clover. I think that cover crop should be used more, actually. That's a kind of an old standby. It kind of looks more like alfalfa than a clover, but it is something to look at. So I did some research. This is several years back. This is good scientific research, replicated three times. And I want to take you, walk you through this. You're going to hang with me tight here. So I always, when you're testing cover crops, I always put in a zero nitrogen. Not that I'm promoting that, but that way we can see the actual effect of the cover crop. Are you with me? So we can see what is that cover crop doing so we can then manage it. So here's zero nitrogen. Now, um, these yields are low, zero nitrogen, and it was a dry year. So the yields are low. Um, but we had a control plot with no cover crops, and to be fair, see I'm a farmer, I want to be fair to the test. I knew that the legumes are going to be providing nitrogen to the corn, so I thought, you know, I'm going to add 75 pounds on the planter with the control plot. So I did that. You can see here the control. This plot had 75 pounds of nitrogen added. Now look at these yields here. If you can go and just kind of look down the, the yields here, that control plot, even though it had 75 pounds and the other ones had zero nitrogen, it still yielded the worst. 
So there's more than just the nitrogen effect here. I think it's because of the way the quirk of the weather that year. Sometimes the weather quirks work for you in cover crops and sometimes against you. This happened to be the year it was a little wet early and then it got dry. It got dry in late June, early July. My cover crops took moisture out of the ground when they should have and they held it when they should have. Sometimes if it's dry early, it takes moisture out of the ground and might not cash crop, it might hurt your cash crop. This year it worked with me. But I just show you this to show you that it's more than just a nitrogen effect. It's sometimes I just call it the biological effect because I don't know what else to call it. Now, when we looked at the, when we put on 120 pounds in addition to what the cover crop gave us, and in addition to that 75 pounds, so that plot that was a control had 120 plus 75, which is 195 pounds, pretty normal application for corn. Again, a dry year, you can see those yields are down. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is that the legume cover crops boosted my yields beyond what fertilizer ever could. And I like to say at this point, cover crops make fertilizer more efficient. That takes some time to get into sometimes. But when you start understanding the dynamics of what cover crops can do, I will tell you that they will make fertilizer more efficient. Are there any questions about, about this uh, chart? I'll just kind of wrap up the, uh, the results here. Um, let me know if there's a question. All the control plots down here that didn't have a cover crop was 110 regarding of what nitrogen was put on it. And then here, all the cover crop plots was 143. 32 bushel yield advantage here, only dry year where we use legume cover crops. That to me is significant. Now, we would have an ideal year. I've done enough research to know that number would not be as high. Cover crops shine when the investment that you put in them pays you back with a challenging year. Could be wet, could be dry, whatever. But that's what cover crops are really going to pay. Any questions on this just little series of data here? I have uh, the Crown Bunch. How late can you plant that in September? So uh, he asked, when, how late can you plant the hairy batch? Yeah. Let me ask you guys up here. Tell me, those of you who have planted, what do you think? End of September? Am I close? End of September is too late. Early September. Early September. So that limits you. I would say the interseeding would be an option if you're growing corn. You know, or can you grow small grains? Yeah, I was thinking about whether you could plant that with uh, Tredicale. Usually planted like late September, mid to late September. Okay. Is it triticale for a cover crop or for forage? For forage. So he asked if you plant it with triticale a little later than that for forage. And again, I'm sure represented in this room, there's some variability, microclimates, that can be exceptions to what we're talking about here. Uh, if you have, my, my answer to that question is, if you happen to get an earlier planting window than normal, now you have information on what to do. Yes, let me put some batch in if you can plant the 15th of September. On the late side, but maybe that's a chance. If you can't plant till the end of September, probably not worth it. You know, is what I'm kind of gathering here. So. Okay, here's another one. Uh, this is uh, down on my farm, and I guess I wasn't really introduced where I'm from. Those of you all know, I'm from southern Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, five and a half hours south here. Obviously, a little longer growing season both ends. Uh, this here is around the 20th of May. Crimson clover, pretty much full bloom. Going in there, in this case, I'm not rolling it. I have a 15-inch plant, and I'm planting silage corn. This is my field, but I'm planting silage corn for my Amish neighbors. And um, no nitrogen applied. There's no need to put nitrogen on, on the, with the planter. Uh, the only reason that you can see those tanks are almost empty. Sometimes I'll fill them up just for weight. Need it, but you don't need to put nitrogen. This, this is we got maximum nitrogen production. Probably that crimson clover is giving me maybe 100 pounds. This is how that field looked later on. 
I'm just saying here, we added 80 pounds of nitrogen in side dress. That field yielded 27 tons of silage, and that included an acre and a half near the woods that the deer pretty much got. I got deer down there too. Uh, but not a bad yield for that kind of nitrogen. And what was interesting is the Amish guy told me, in his words, that silage really fed well. And I think that taps into something here that when we start taking this whole cover crop from the whole planting aspect of it into the, you're talking soil health, but what about the plant health? What about forage quality? I'm, I'm of the belief, and I will say I'm in the regenerative agricultural space, if you want to pay me uh, right now, it's kind of the buzzword, um, and that we need to start talking about nutrition in our crops. I'm going to touch on this real soon here. It's going to be my wrap up here on this. But there's something about high use of fertilizers is not helping us for nutrition to some degree with minerals and all that stuff. I'm not going to get into it. I'm just mentioning it. The fact that he said it fed, well, I like that. And I'm thinking because you know, a little bit more biology is involved in growing this crop. Yes, sir. I read articles and research from the University of Canada about that green. Yep. That planting green. Yep. Planting green. And you actually lose the yield of the competition, but not planting green since you put it in. Right. We've got trials that shows shock areas versus planting green. Yeah. Did they cover against that? So the question is about planting green. You saw a study that said that you can have lower yields planting green. And I would say that's entirely possible. Um, I don't tend to look at research now as the yield is the determining factor if it's a good practice or not. You have to look at bigger pictures than that. Um, of course, as a farmer, if you're a cash grain farmer, look at profit per acre. Then we can have a good discussion. If we're a dairy person or someone who's using forage is quality per acre. And we need to start shifting that a little bit in that way. Uh, and you know, that's a, it's kind of a loaded question because I've been planting green. I've done studies three years with, with Penn State University of planting green. And we ended up seeing that there was, there was just essentially no yield difference. Yes, sometimes lower, sometimes higher. And I think we as farmers are kind of caught in a rut of everything we do is based on yield. That's good, but that's not the whole picture. Because what I am doing now planting green, and I'll just jump ahead, because I was going to talk about that last, is that I'm reducing my insecticide. I've eliminated them. So now I'm saving some money. I'm also saving some money on herbicides. And I'm saving some money on fertility. I don't have the highest yields. But I'd like to argue that I have the most profit. And that's what keeps me in business from year to year. We got to change our thinking a little bit on that. Um, must move on. This is another one I did here, setting up for corn. Again, after small grain. Uh, I'm not going to go over all those uh, cover crops there. Uh, this is what got my attention, though. Took the yield checks in there, and my best yield came from 60 units of N. It didn't help by adding nitrogen. Now this is more like my average yields here, but uh, zero and 190 bushel. How's that possible? Cover crops. I wish it went out of control. I did. That would have been more insightful. But that was on a good year and it showed up pretty good. So, you know, it can work. Um, so if we have good lagoon cover crops, we might not need nitrogen until side dress time. Just saying that's possible. This is in the context of if and when nitrogen prices go higher, I'm going to think about that. Managing termination and nitrogen production, kind of covered that. Um, are there any vegetable producers in here? Any, I guess, specifically pumpkin growers? Okay, no pumpkin growers, that's fine. I grow pumpkins and squash. This is just a great opportunity. It's a little later. We start planting the first of June. They grow up, we roll it down, we plant. I can cut my herbicides down, I cut my fertilizer down. Um, so it's just a really neat way to be able to do that. Interceding lagoon cover crops, we talked about this a uh, year or two ago I was here. I know it's a topic around here. This is a way, maybe the best way, for you to get legumes into your rotation. Um, 
you can go with rigs that are set up to both side press, nitrogen, and put cover crops on at once. So you're saving that trip. It's not an extra trip across the field uh, in that regard. How much not less nitrogen can I use? Well, that depends. There are many variables. Uh, I think the, the biggest one here is maturity. Uh, when the, the, the type of legume or the maturity of it when it's terminated. Maximum nitrogen production is at first flower. Anything beyond that, it doesn't really tail off much, but it doesn't increase. Anything before that, it can tail off, um, you know. You need to do your own research. Um, I wish it was easier. I wish I could give you a formula. But you really have to do your own research on your own farm. For some of you, you're not going to do it. I get it. Some of you is like, just try a few things, see what works. Uh, for corn, here at the bottom, a good stand of hairy vegetable first plume, you may only need an additional 46, 40 to 60 pounds of nitrogen at side rest. But then again, I would recommend you test to see what works on your farm. So you can save over 100, maybe up to 150 pounds if you can work this scenario out, if the weather crop rates. A lot of things have to fall in line for this to happen. Here's kind of review here on this, key management tips. Choose the best nitrogen producing species. Plant it as soon as possible. We talked about using inoculant, the importance of that. Try to use winter hardy selections, maybe you can be able to plant a little later. Strategize to plant your cash crop, like last one. Um, plant into a green legume, mixed with other species. These are some of the things that um, are interesting. Okay, let's go south to Argentina. I was just there three weeks ago. 102 degrees. Yes, Fahrenheit. It's summer down there. This is them planting into hairy vetch. Planting soybeans into hairy vetch. I was like, why do you plant a legume into a legume? I gotta tell you, this messed with me. <laughs> Not what I teach. We teach, I teach, you plant soybeans into cedar rye. That's what we do. That's what works here. Oh, no, we, we, we have better yield. And the other thing they told me that I would like, I'm going to have to try this. They get docked if they get below 30, I think it's 38% protein on their beans. Their beans are checked. So they don't get a premium as a ball. They said they're getting 40, 41% protein on their beans grown to hairy vetch. I had never heard that before. So, Don, I don't know. I'm going to have to try planting some beans and hairy vetch. It goes against everything I thought, and they're almost all doing it. Now, I've got to tell you, it's Argentina. This is a latitude similar to Georgia, Mississippi, in that, for, for here in the U.S. So they have time to plant. Now, these were, this was at a field day. It was just that three weeks ago. They were just planting. And you might be curious about that drill. I've never seen a drill like that. Man, that thing put them seeds in the ground through that thick thatch. It was incredible. And they have, what they did, they have these heavy duty culvers sinking in four to six inches. And then they have these notched uh, uh, blades. How many of you have seen these blades? These are sold in the US. Four millimeters wide. I got a, I got a set. That was pretty cool to see them down there. Um, precision planting meters. The company here in the US, precision planting. This is on a drill. Just a little wider than seven and a half inches are typical, just a little bit wider. Uh, so what the, the, the drill meters out on top, and then the seeds fall into this meter, and then the meter map. This is just like a corn plant. This is the drill simulating seeds like a corn plant, uh, right there close to the you know just you know, close to the soil. Good good spacing and everything. And then in the back they have their adjustable toe-in closing wheels. And um, you, you see we have our standard depth uh, control right there for depth pressure. Back here is the toe-in. And this is what really confounds me about why US manufacturers have not got up to speed. This is a, um, oh shoot, I was hoping this would work. Um, as a video here. Let me see if I do it again. Yeah. Okay, so this is a John Deere toe-in made in Brazil. There you have it. So what that is, able to do is to adjust the toe end of your closing wheels. You don't need as much pressure. You see the planters most of us use today is 1970s technology. To close the seed slot until ground, to pack the soil 
around the seed. We don't need to do that in no till cover up. We just need to close it. So it's just a simple angle design. John Deere's making this for Brazil. I've seen this, that was taken in South Africa when I was there a year and a half ago. All the planters in Europe have this feature on. Now, Getter just came out with it this year. I tested, they made 100 units, I, they gave me two, I tested them, they're working. So I think this is a feature that's gonna help us as no-till farmers to be able to close that seed slot under high residue conditions, under thatched, I call it thatched roots. You know, they're just tough to close sometimes. So it, it, it kind of made me mad. John Deere is doing this in South America, they don't have it here, come on. Ten What's minutes. up with that? 10 minutes. Okay, thank you, Dennis. Perfect. Uh, road cleaners, um, if you're working in hairy batch, you could run the risk of speaking words that you don't speak around the women and children, so to speak, if hairy batch wraps around your road cleaners or your closing wheels. It can be a problem. Now these are shark tooth. See the design they have there? They don't tend to wrap. Inside there's a deflector to keep it from wrapping. I don't use a coulter in my planter. I have air. If you have air hydraulics, you might not need to use a coulter if you have good openers. Okay, I'm not going to spend much time on this. Just, just saying, sometimes going into carry vetch, lift the road cleaners completely out of the ground so they're not even touching anything. It may be easier. That's a, that's, that's a tip I want to give you. Carry vetch is easy to cut through. Um, and double disc openers with good down pressure, sometimes simpler is much better. I'm not saying you don't use them, I'm saying you got to know how to manage that. That can be very frustrating. Um, planting at the ideal time, this is me cutting uh, corn. I like to watch this from my tractor as I plant cover crops. So this is using a precision planter. 15 inch planter, um, and, and um, there's actually plates now, like for precision planting, and even for Kinsey brush meters, uh, they're coming out with plates that you can plant mixes with, even small seeded cover crops like annual ryegrass, crimson clover. So again, just kind of giving you some information that's out there now, we can use our planters. Um, having your planter dialed in to go through cover crops that are standing, uh, is, is something that may take some time. And one of the things that can be frustrating is hairy vetch. It's a viney, very succulent crop, and it can catch on your planter. It can catch on anything that would grab it. And so every couple rounds, you have to get off and pull off the chunks that are collecting on your planter. Well, I had that problem once. Sometimes if you roll it, there's no issue. But I put these um, strings across. Very simple fix. It pushed the cover crop down so it wouldn't catch in some of the parts of my planter. So sometimes you have to do stuff like this. And sometimes it's a simple fix, sometimes it's done. And then you have this problem. I like spoke tight closing wheels. Well, when you start planting the stuff that's three feet high, it can wrap around that type of wheel. And especially if you have a 24 row planter, that's frustrating. Because that will wear, that will burn out a bearing eventually, or stop it from turning. And this is how it may look. You have to go home on a beautiful day, you're planting corn, and to clean out these wheels, not a good day. But, what do we do? Give up? Better we solve the problem. Here's where, again, I'll refer to Getter, other companies too, they have come out with these deflectors for these spoke type closing wheels to help eliminate this problem. Now, I'm just going to say quick too, that um, having these toe in adjustments, we may not need aggressive finger tight, spoke tight closing wheels. Um, just saying. So we'll see how that all pans out. So, everything I've said today here, you know, I'm trying to help to use beneficial ways to cover crops. You just can't throw cover crops on and expect miracles. Um, I just want to give us that reality check. This was in Hungary, I was there twice. Very poor soil, that was a cover crop of mustard. I say it's a very poor cover crop, unless you're trying to do fumigation, which can be done. 
This would have been a great area to have some mixes and legumes in. That's one of my point of this picture here. The farmer was disappointed in his cover crop. Well, no kidding. I would have been too. I told him, add a legume next year. Then it will help, because it's a nitrogen deficiency there on certain parts of the field. No history of manure or anything. So again, kind of poor type soil, but you got to know what you're doing here. We need to work with nature. We've been taught to control nature with tools. It's like, what am I going to kill today? It's kind of our initial reaction. I have a whole talk on this, but I would like to suggest, how can I get more life in my operation? How can I mimic nature to a greater degree? That's a, another challenge I want to leave with you. One of the things I've found to be helpful is to find a mentor. There's probably people here today that you regularly call or be in contact with. Form a little group. Um, it could be a text group, it could be messenger, it could be all these different formats we have out there. This is one of my, my mentors, Frederick Thomas from France. Yeah, we're an ocean apart. We have a lot of similarities, mainly our innovative spirit. And so we try to figure things out, how to work out things, how to solve problems. And it's been fun to be able to do that. Uh, planting green, we've alluded to that a couple times. I'm kind of surprised how much planting green has taken off nationwide. Last year at the National No-Till Conference in Indianapolis, Indiana, 1,000 farmers there. And <clears throat> as I recall, a good 30% raised their hands when they asked if they planted green. Now that could be just one field, but just saying. I was surprised it was that number. So Dennis asked me here to uh, touch a little bit at the end on <clears throat> what some of the opportunities are out there um, that are beyond just financial um, and so forth. Now, it, is, it is financial, but what, you know, how can we sell this idea of, I'll call it, soil health, regenerative ag? Meet your new boss. Had the, the, the cover of Successful Farming a couple years ago. So we have the consumers now who have no connection to agriculture, right? And we generally don't have any connection to the people who are the end users of the food we grow. That's a problem. Because what, the way I'll say she thinks we should grow stuff isn't always practical. But there are customers. So we just can't dismiss them. What are they saying? With the advent of social media, smartphones, and all this, our customers these days want to know how their food was grown. And the whole thing of transparency in that is here. And we as farmers need to pay attention because big companies are paying attention. The people who sell to our end users are paying attention. Look at that list. Every single one of them I have identified that they have some sort of sustainability plan or some sort of a plan that includes soil health. Yes, soil health. Um, I was asked to speak for Bonduel. Probably no of you, none of you heard of Bonduel, the largest food, frozen food processor in the world based in France. They have, they have factories here in the US. They, they asked me to help them to uh, be able to use cover crops and no-till. And uh, thank you, He's my wife, Sherry. Thank you, Sherry. I ah, appreciate that, thanks for coming. <laughs> so this is me in Hungary at one of their back, that's with field managers that are overseeing the farmers. 25,000 acres of sweet corn through that place. I'm trying to figure out how to grow cover crops in the context of sweet corn. Why? Because of the market that Bonduel has. They want to say something that their products are grown using soil health principles. Wrangler jeans. How many of you know that Wrangler jeans have this thing going now of promoting no-till cover crops in cotton? I've been down there, I've consulted for them, this is their headquarters. And um, so they come out with rooted collection. You can go online right now and look for rooted collection. You can see the farms that are using it. You can choose the gene if it was the cotton was grown in five different states. And there's farmers featured there. Now, because of my connection with them, I have a pair on right now. These were grown in North Carolina. I didn't pay the list price of $99. 
because I don't buy $99 jeans. But that's one of the perks of being a consultant forever. They send you a pair of jeans. That's cool. Um, in the inside pocket is this. The name of the farm and the deal over here, you can look at it. Are these jeans worth $99? No, not to me. But to some people they are because they're willing to pay an extra 50 bucks because someone's out there trying to save the earth. Okay, I'm not quite in that crowd, but that's a market. That's a market out there. We gotta pay attention to some of this. Eventually they told me they'll be down in 1999, which is my style, but anyway. I uh, just wanna let you know this is coming. Cargill, you've heard of Cargill. I don't know if they buy stuff around here, but they're looking at things. How can they, somehow, how can farmers show that they're doing something for soil health? And uh, Land O'Lakes, they have their sustain program where dairy farmers will type in this computer program, what they did, they come up with a number, and then they'll be able to market that to their consumers. Our farmers are doing this. They're planting cover crops to keep nitrates out of Lake Erie, or whatever. It's a story. So pay attention. This is just yesterday. December 17th, Trust in Food, Farm Journal Initiative. How many of you have heard of this? This started a couple years ago, and it's exactly what I'm talking about now. They have meetings every winter. They're coming, there's one coming up in Chicago, I think it is, pretty soon. They come out with this, McDonald's selects its first flagship farmer. I can't say I'm a McDonald's fan, but the reality is the McDonald's is going down this road should give you a little bit of a, you, 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 you know, I, I see it as an opportunity. Not that you're going to be growing potatoes for McDonald's French fries. I'm just pointing this out as opportunities. Well, okay, we're just about done, Dennis. So I'm just going to go through this. What new markets do you have? Maybe it's not a GMO. Maybe cover crop seed production. I'm going to show you thing here soon. Malting grains, that's a big thing for locally grown. Indigo, just going to mention that. Pay attention. Carbon credits, all this stuff. There's some things out there that can help uh, us this. This is some hairy, vet, or some hairy vetch peas and oil seed rape that I grew for cover crop. This is an alternative market. You guys can do this here. Come back in then later. It's the exact same field and combine that. <laughs> So, finally, I'm writing a book. And this book has to do with pretty much the last five minutes of what I shared, where I give example after example of opportunities that we have now as farmers for those of us who grow cover crops and use soil health principles. Future Proof Farm, Changing Mindsets in a Changing World. Uh, if you're interested in signing up to get more information, steveroff.com. Uh, I just say this, my, my goal in writing this book is to give you an opportunity for the future so that your farm does not become obsolete. So thank you again, Dennis, for inviting me. I'll be right back here for another topic soon, and I appreciate everything you guys do. You want to tell them what's on the table back there? So <clears throat> back on the table back there on the left-hand side of the room, my wife's back here, I have some brochures. Uh, about the hemp, which I'm going to talk about, and also my 10% cover crop challenge. My challenge to you is to increase the use of, or uh, a more dynamic of 10% 10% of your cover crop. So I have some pointers back there and that. So that's what I have back on the table. Thanks, Dennis, for that. Okay. Um, just so you know, Steve is going to head out of Dodge after lunch, so. You know he'll be back after the break, but you got to talk to him before one o'clock. Uh, we can take about a 10, 15 minute break and then we'll come right back. And Steve will be back up again.